Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's webinar, Facing Climate Change Together, What's Happening in Hingham, Cohasset, and Hall. My name is Kathy Schutzlein, and I'm the chair of the League of Women Voters of Hingham, and I'll be the moderator for tonight's webinar, which is being recorded. The League of Women Voters is proud to be nonpartisan, neither supporting nor opposing candidates or political parties at any level of government, but always working on vital issues of concern to members and the public. The League has been at the forefront of the environmental protection movement for decades, consistently supporting legislation to preserve our natural resources and protect public health. Tonight's webinar is an effort that came directly from our interest from our members. At our September meeting, when asked what issues our members were most interested in, climate change was number one. Since our Hingham League is actually regional, including members from surrounding towns, we wanted to look at the issues of each of our communities. We're hoping to identify ways that we can all come together to fulfill our common objective of influencing public policy through advocacy. This webinar is possible because of the work of League members Eva Marks, Chartis Tibbetts, Celia Nolan, Kate Bolin, and Nina Welford. Thank you all for the work that you did to make tonight possible. Tonight, we're going to hear from two speakers from each of the three communities, one speaker from the town and one from an environmental activist group within the community. First, we'll hear from Cohasset, then Hull, and then Hingham. We will keep our speakers to seven minutes each. After this, we've invited each of our state legislators to give a short two minute response to what is being done at the state level to address these issues. During the presentations, please ask any questions by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and typing in your question. After we hear from our elected officials, I'll bring forth as many questions as possible before the end of the program. Now let's get started. We're fortunate to have from Cohasset, Steve Winner and Corey Evans. Steve is a retired industrial statistician spending his career helping scientists and engineers improve their experiments, data analysis, and modeling. He now volunteers with several environmental organizations focused on addressing the challenges of climate change and reducing carbon emissions. He serves on Cohasset Alternative Energy Com Committee to help the town transition towards 100% renewable energy. Corey is a member of the Cohasset Select Board. Thank you both for being with us tonight. And Corey and Steve, the floor is yours. Thank you uh, all very much for having both of us tonight. Um, thank you for letting me fill in for uh, the Coasset Select Board Chair, Diane Kennedy. Uh, she had another very pressing town matter. Um, so thank you again for letting me fill in. I do wanna begin by saying that, that Coasset is blessed with uh, one of the most vibrant uh, alternative energy committees that, that I've really seen and, and they are really the standout committee here in town. Uh, the board is comprised of members that have a variety of very related professional skills uh, from the energy industry to solar development to engineering. Um, Steve Winter, who is uh, following me and joining me has been referred to by the uh, alternative energy uh, committee chair as the uh, father of Cohasset Solar. Um, and they're working on a lot of great stuff. Uh, but before we get to that, I just wanted to talk, take a little step back and just talk about some of the challenges that, that Cohasset is facing um, broadly in regards to climate change. Um, right now, Cohasset has literally millions of dollars in potential capital projects that are either directly related to or closely connected to some of the challenges due to climate change. And a lot of that has to do with sea level rise. There are projects that span from waterproofing manhole covers and hardening critical infrastructure generators and pumps, uh, all the way to developing emergency plans that way first responders can get to neighborhoods that may flood. Our own first responding, uh, you know, first responders building, the uh, fire department, the police department is actually located in a road that floods. And when that road floods, a very large part of the community is cut off from emergency services. So the list goes on here, but there are millions of dollars and a lot of big projects that are occurring just to deal with stuff in the short term. On the select board level, our 2021 goal 
we state it as community health. And that's obviously very connected to the pandemic. But what allowed us to do is frame what we wanted to do this year in the lens of what are aspects of a healthy community. And some of those aspects include clean air, clean water, open space, uh, encouraging residents to use, to not use their vehicles, whether that's walking or public transportation. To that end, a few years ago, the Cohasset, uh, Cohasset launched a Cohasset master plan and identified high, priorities, high priority areas where residents want to walk instead of using their car. Just a few months ago, Cohasset was part of a multi-town effort to preserve public transportation in the form of the Greenbush and the ferry. The MBTA came out with a plan which basically cut off the ferry completely and could have cut off the Greenbush train. Part of their decision matrix was that our communities had cars. And together with our uh, state level elected representatives, we were able to put a campaign together that said a car is not a reasonable alternative to public transportation. We used information that came from uh, Boston 2030 and the MBTA Focus 40, the, the state's own uh, you know, research and reports, which prioritize reducing carbon emissions in Boston and made public transportation a part of that. So together, we had this very strong push that continues to this day. That way, the South Shore has alternatives to cars, uh, cars being the number one source of carbon emissions in our area, and that's really part of keeping our community healthy. Coasset also has a very vibrant and very involved open space committee. We have a variety of really beautiful parks, both large and small, scattered throughout town. And it's important that we continue to preserve these areas and make them accessible. That way the residents can you know, connect with nature. Um, all that being said, at the same time, we're also looking to the future when it comes to uh, energy resiliency and uh, clean power. And I'd like to hand it off to Steve at this point to go through all the stuff that we've been doing on that front. Steve. Thank you, Corey. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen here, show a few slides. I wanna thank the um, League of Women Voters of Hingham for sponsoring this webinar. It's uh, really important, I think, for us to learn as much as we can about the climate uh, crisis and uh, to talk about it it's the only way we're gonna be able to effectively deal with it. I'm gonna talk mostly about the Cohasset uh, Alternative Energy Committee, but first I wanted to show this uh, photograph I took at the Youth Global Strike in Boston in, in September, 2019. I think this is a very powerful image. I always get uh, very emotional every time I look at it to think that our students are compelled to uh, learn about these terrible um, things that uh, are in, in, impacting our earth. But this shows the rise in carbon emissions, carbon dioxide emissions into the atmosphere from 1950 to 2019. That's this uh, wiggly purple line here. And the wiggles are real. They represent the earth breathing. Uh, in the uh, spring and summer, uh, the earth breathes in uh, carbon dioxide into leaves and then in the fall and winter, um, the leaves fall and decay and the earth exhales. Um, the uh, amount of carbon dioxide has gone from 280 parts per million to over 415 parts per million. This line that I drew in the middle is at 350 parts per million. That is the maximum level of carbon dioxide that the earth can sustain without very serious effects of climate change. And this was pointed out by James Hansen to uh, Congress in 1988. So we've learned, we've known for more than three decades that this is a serious problem and we have yet to uh, effectively uh, deal with it. Um, this is a map of uh, flood hazards in Cohasset. I took this from the Cohas Cohasset Hazard Mitigation Plan. There's a lot of information in, in this uh, plan, including some forecasts. Uh, it turns out in the last 100 years, Cohasset has seen a foot of sea level rise. And uh, in the next 80 years, up to 2100, we're going to see at least two feet more and maybe more than 10 feet of sea level rise, depending on uh, how we address the climate crisis. So uh, to the Alternative Energy Committee, what, what did we uh, do last year? Well, uh, we continued our efficiency improvements to town buildings with a half a million dollar grant uh, from the Green Communities Program at, uh, in the state of Massachusetts. Uh, we submitted a program 
to the Mass uh, Department of Public Utilities for green electricity um, for all the Cohasset residents and, and uh, businesses in Cohasset. This will be a, disc, uh, a group um, bulk buying uh, contract to get uh, uh, inexpensive electricity with a, a huge portion of a green energy, wind and solar generated uh, in, in New England. Uh, we finished a microgrid study. Uh, that's to help us deal with uh, the power outages we, we experienced much too often in Cohasset. I'll talk a little more about that in a moment. And we installed 20 vehicle electric vehicle charging ports in Cohasset. These are free to anyone. Uh, we don't charge, although in the future we may have to start charging. It might cost you as much as $2 to fill up your car with electricity. This was a celebration we had at the, uh, at the uh, Landfill Solar Array when it opened in September 2017. So far, we've saved the town more than $200,000 in, in electricity uh, bills and uh, generated over 2,000 kilowatt hours of electricity. So what, what are the programs for this year? Well, we found that there's a great potential in town for on town public and private uh, sites for more solar. And we've had several proposals from uh, several different companies that are very exciting. If uh, we brought all those to fruition, we generate more power than the municipality needs. And we have a lot left over for the residents and businesses of Cohasset. So now we're trying to uh, weigh these uh, uh, proposals and decide which ones to move forward with and how to structure the program to the best benefit of Cohasset. Uh, microgrid Mondays, microgrid Mondays. We, we're gonna have some virtual tours open to the public to, so people can learn about microgrids and what the opportunity there is. So uh, check the town website for details on that. Earth Day is coming up and, and the committee is gonna participate. Uh, the last thing, uh, Solarize Plus. Uh, we're uh, possibly gonna join with Situate and Marshfield and, and getting a, a discount program um, for various kinds of green technology, not just solar panels, but also heat pumps, uh, batteries, uh, uh, electric vehicles, and, and other things. So um, uh, you can wait for that. Um, I want to talk about the uh, Cohasset Center for Student Coastal Research. This is a wonderful resource that we have in town to help our young folks learn about the environmental problems and climate change and give them a chance to do real scientific research. A, a uh, alumnus of this program uh, went on to get his PhD and he's now gonna give a talk tomorrow evening about his work on uh, his research on the genetics of whales. So please join, join if you like. Uh, just a few words about uh, uh, social activism. It's very important. We're never going to solve the problem just by our own individual efforts. We have to join together and as a society uh, attack the problem. And uh, it looks like our young folks are leading the way. This is a group of, of, uh, of young people from the Sunrise Movement, and we're all charging off to uh, Representative Stephen Lynch's office to lobby for the Green New Deal. Uh, I'm, I'm the only old person there. And I'm there as a representative of 350 Massachusetts, but everybody else is, I think you had to get to the ages of everybody and be less than my age. Okay, just um, a few words about uh, climate activism organizations. I mentioned 350 Massachusetts. Uh, the Four River Residents Against the Presser Station are a, a real dynamo of a, of a um, activist group. Uh, they've been fighting for six years to against the, uh, uh, gas infrastructure uh, has uh, been completed, but not in operation yet in uh, Weymouth. Um, I want to mention the Citizens Climate Lobby. Uh, they lobby for a carbon tax. And if we had a carbon tax that uh, was high enough, that would sure as hell uh, uh, push our um, carbon footprint down. Um, um, so anyways, uh, thank you very much. And uh, my time's up. <laughs> I'll stop Great. sharing here. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Corey and Steve. I'll remind our attendees, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to submit those. And I'll do my best to get to them at the end of the program. Next, we'll hear from Jake Valancourt and Judith Van Ham. Jake is the chair of Hull Clean Energy Climate Action Committee and a member of Hull's Municipal Light Plant Board. Judith is a city planner with a master's degree from Penn. She's worked for the city of Boston and the town of Hull. And over the last 25 years, she's focused on protecting land along the Weir River estuary 
and addressing climate change. She helped start Sustainable South Shore, a chapter of Mass Climate Action Network, and along with Steve Winter, currently co-chairs the 350 Mass South Shore chapter. Jake and Judith, thank you for joining us and the floor is yours. Thank you, Kath, and to uh, Judith, you're on mute. If you want to go ahead and speak first, I'll I'll go right after you. How do I get oh the video? Uh, just hit start video. I mine's also locked out actually right now. Okay, it's not doing anything when I click on it. It says the host has to stop it. Yep, mine says the same thing. Okay, Kath, can you? I, I don't mind talking, just... There we go. Oh, no. Dina, can you unmute them? Um, okay, now I have to click on start my video. Yep. Got it. There you go. Thank you. Okay, I'm here. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Super. Okay, so... This is... It feels very new to me to do this. Uh, what I thought I'd tell people is how this kind of sequence that, that we did. And um, I started working on these things around the year 2000. At the, and the two parts of climate that I've worked on are uh, cutting emissions and you know getting a plan for doing that and on transportation. And back, just after 2000, when I was working on the estuary, I, I helped take a group from one side of the boulevard, George Washington Boulevard, to the other to walk to some land that we were looking at. There was a selectman with us who was a, a benefactor for the project. He had his older son and his 12-year-old son. The selectman, myself, and the older son crossed the street. The younger boy was left on the other side with some other grown-ups. I could see him wanting to run out across that four-lane road without knowing that you had to wait, you know, for that little space between cars. And I said, we've got to change this. We've got to have a way that you can cross the street easily. It doesn't have that much traffic on it. So I went and looked for a bus that could take more traffic off. I found some electric trolleys. I was into electric and that we could have gotten for free, but it would have required having a person in every seat on every trip, 7 a.m. to 11 p.m., sometimes traveling 12 miles an hour in order to pay for the operation of those. Not gonna happen. So I looked online to see if there were some other electrified way of traveling that would work. I found solar personal rapid transit and I've been working since then to make it happen. This past week, uh, and I've had Pat O'Connor, Senator O'Connor's help uh, getting a bill into the legislature. This past week, one sentence out of that bill <laughs> got passed, that's enough to make this happen. It says that the uh, Secretary of uh, Energy and Environmental Affairs can work with the head of the uh, Mass Department of Transportation to enable so, uh, solar mobility, just a big title, to, to work. And it put in $1.3 million uh, that Senator Pacheco thought would be helpful. So we now have a mandate to move. At the very end of this um, session here, there will be a video that you can watch that we put together so you could get a feel for what, how nice it would be to be able to ride in something that is as enjoyable as riding the ferry, you know, comfortable, you can use your time yourself, but as much fun as going to Paragon Park. You're up there in your little, pod traveling along. And the amazing thing is, it's more affordable, faster, more convenient than a car. So um, we're hoping that if this gets built and has a, a network that covers the state, 
people will just say, why would I take a car? I, we're, I have to just park it. I can't read my stuff or you know, text or whatever I want to do when I'm driving. I have to be doing this. You know? So uh, people will say, of course, this is how I'm going to travel. And I want you to see what that means. 43% of, of our emissions come from transportation. Um, the things that we've been talking about so far, putting solar on buildings and stuff, don't touch that. The, there is, the reason it's 43% is that we've been able to close down uh, gas burning electric power plants, but we haven't really made an impact on transportation. So it's sitting there while the other ones get smaller and its share gets bigger. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that now that this little bill has passed that we'll be able to talk between different communities on, on this topic. How much time do I have left? Somebody tell me. Two minutes. Two minutes, okay. So I wanna tell you how Jake got into this. First of all, we're all connected. Laura got helped get the 350 mass group going that I eventually became co-chair of. Um, when I was consulting to Cohasis Alternative Energy Committee, I asked Steve Wenner to join it. And J Jake came into my life. We decided in Hull to, after uh, learning about what Lexington has done, to take a, a, a motion to town meeting to create a climate action plan. And um, at the meeting where we're working on this, two people sat down next to me. Jake was on one side, you know, he looked important. But when he stood up, he said, what I do is I run this national um, industrial recycling company. I thought, what does that have to do with, with climate? So Jake, before you start, explain that because what has happened is Jake is so good at doing things. He's the most efficient person I think I've ever met. Um, and he returns phone calls. He Once he got into this, he ran for the light board, he got elected. He's um, a really important part of what's happening in Hull. Is that my time? You got 30 seconds. Okay. <laughs> uh, that's it. Just go for it right now. All right. Well, thank you, Judith. I appreciate it. So I met Judith, um, I think we're going on three years ago now, uh, if not already past three years ago. And it was just a, a random email that said there's a group in Hull getting together tonight to talk about environmental activism locally. And I saw that and I told my husband, I have to go. He said, yes, you do. So I went. I had no idea what the, who the group was. I didn't know a single person there besides my husband and uh, sat down and listened to what was going on. And I said to myself, essentially, this is a group of really passionate people who are all volunteers and I, I respect that. And what I felt was needed was a bit of organization and uh, somebody who pushes. And I think that um, professionally, what I can say, I convince people to do if we want to call them people, really what I'm convincing companies to do is take something they throw away and instead of throwing it away, talking about post-industrial waste, we're going to turn it into a usable, durable good or product uh, or, or energy in some cases, but rarely. And uh, that's what my expertise is in. I own um, two companies, one that is called Waste Hub that, that does exactly that. And the other company is a spinoff company that takes um, waste material from the manufacture of insulation and actually produces an abrasive that outperforms and is safer. And uh, anyways, uh, this isn't a commercial for my companies. I do things that are not conventional. Um, when I started the first business, I co-founded uh, Waste Hub. My family uh, has an insurance business back down in Rhode Island. And basically they said, well, that's cute. When you fail, we'll be here and you can come back and, and still be a business owner with us. And, you know, we'd like you to inherit the business and take it over one day. And of course, um, 
I guess I proved them wrong because uh, now it's almost 10 years later and uh, we have a, a multi-million dollar business that employs, you know, a couple dozen people per company and uh, is, is growing and we've diverted, we've diverted over, I think, four and a half, maybe five billion pounds of material that would have been in a landfill if it wasn't for what we're doing and we're growing that. So that's the impact that I've had professionally. Volunteer wise, um, I, I'm now the chair of the committee that Judith formed, which is CECAC, it's the Clean Energy Climate Action Committee. It's, it is essentially the same uh, that Steve Wenner has uh, in the town over, but we have a different name and our, our path is a little bit different, but uh, we essentially are trying to achieve the same thing. We've set a goal for 100% clean energy. And by clean energy, we mean non-carbon emitting energy by, 20, by or before 2030. Uh, and I believe it's actually possible to achieve that before 2030. Uh, one of the things that we are doing or we have done already is essentially a carbon emission, CO2 emission survey, greenhouse gas emission survey is actually more accurate. And that takes the temperature of what the emissions are townwide Roughly, it's not scientifically accurate, it's not perfect, but it's good enough to be useful. And you can't really improve what you don't measure. So on an annual basis, the CECAC, Clean Energy Climate Action Committee, is planning to measure that once per year to essentially record the progress that we're making against our goal. Uh, the goal is 100% clean energy by 2030. And in terms of electrical power in town, we, that's probably an easily achievable goal. We can likely exceed that. But in terms of total emissions, could we bring the carbon emissions in Hull to zero or even uh, a negative number by producing more clean energy than we consume? That's possible. Uh, now, fast forward to last summer, I was approached by Laura Burns and some other folks, and they said, you need to run for the light board. And I said, yikes, why would I do another thing that I don't have time to do? And after I heard a bit about what the municipal light plants in Massachusetts do and the role they have, I realized, you're right, I do need to do that and I need to win. And I need to push my light board as hard as I can to advance on a number of things about affordability, access to clean power, um, and, potentially even use the, the resources we have in Hull to do amazing things like make uh, you know, four times maybe the power we need in Hull and sell the rest of it to other communities. Not saying that'll happen, but um, essentially what I'm doing in, my, in the two roles I have for the volunteer roles in Massachusetts is pushing the envelope. Uh, and there's really not a lot of resistance. It's just more of how do you actually make that big giant possible feeling thing happen and become reality? Well, by persisting. Uh, and I think that's what Judith was alluding to. My personality is such that I persist and I don't give up. And one of the things that we're doing as a group collectively, I'm not responsible for this, but we are talking about what we're doing uh, bi-monthly and monthly and quarterly and annually. And some of that is through um, various news outlets that we're connected with, some of it's social media, but all in all, we've attracted a startup from California that has an SBIR. And for those of you who don't know, that's a small business innovative research grant. And I believe, I think they're in a phase two grant, which is a significantly larger chunk of change. Um, maybe it's phase three, but I, I, I'm not sure. Don't quote me on that. Anyhow, they have grant money. They, and, and part of what they need to do is prove a tidal water energy generation scheme and, and essentially show that this will work in the ocean. So we are beginning to um, plant the seeds in town to see if we can't get a small two kilowatt demo or pilot unit built and installed in Hull for this summer. Uh, and part of the idea behind it is to put it at Hull Gut get some folks, uh, assuming that we're all COVID safe, get some folks riding the ferry into Hull, get a little discount at a restaurant because you came in, you took a selfie in front of the machine uh, or the sign we have, whatever, you got to see it, see that it's there, not causing harm to anyone or anything. 
And then you go into town and you, you know, get a bite to eat, enjoy the beach, whatever, and then take the ferry back to Boston. Um, we're trying to sort of connect people to energy, make it more understandable. A lot of people don't understand the impact that we can have by going to clean energy, uh, nor do they understand that this isn't something that's a hundred years away and it's the, the Jetsons and, you know, it's not going to be in my lifetime. No, it's, it's yesterday. It's last week. It's last year. It's, it's last decade. Technologies largely exist. They just need to be brought in. And that's essentially what we're doing. Uh, I thank you. I think that's my time. Thank you very much for inviting me and Judith and uh, Kath, I hand it back to you. Great. I'd thank like you. to add just one thought. Everything that we're talking about here is going to end up saving people money. Just think about it. Great. Thanks so much, Jake and Judith. Next, we'll hear from Laura Burns and Brad Moyer from Hingham. Laura is a co-founder of Hingham Net Zero and a former member of the Hingham Select Board. Brad has been a member of Hingham's Energy Action Committee since 2010 and has been the chair since 2012. During the day, he's a securities lawyer working for Fidelity Investments in Asset Management Division. Laura and Brad, the floor is yours. How do you get me off of here? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to share. Thank, thank you so much, Kathy. I'm going to share my screen. Um, so uh, I am representing here tonight Hingham Net Zero, and I see that we have a lot of our members on board and tell you how we got started and what we're doing. We're a local climate activist group. And the first thing is a lot of people ask us, oh, I can't seem to chew. There we go. A lot of people ask us, what, um, what is net zero anyway? And the idea is very simple. It's a, you take how many carbon emissions you are putting out. Uh, and if you subtract from those, uh, the amount of carbon that you have sequestered, and it's zero, you are at net zero carbon emissions. Sounds easy, but it is incredibly difficult. Um, and here is how we will do it. Um, we won't be doing carbon intensive activities as much as we can, use energy more efficiently, replace fossil fuel energy with uh, low carbon energy sources. And then you get to the point where there might be some carbon emissions that you cannot eliminate at all and you will offset those uh, carbon emissions. But that's uh, being able to do that technology is hard and a long way away. So we had started about a year and a half ago. It was three of us sitting in one of our living rooms. Hingham has done a pretty good job um, studying the climate resilience issues that our town faces, very much like Hall and Cohasset do. Um, but we, Hingham wasn't doing anything about well, what about the causes of climate change? Are we doing our part as a, as a town to um, fix the, the original problem of carbon emissions? And so we thought about what we could do. And our first goal was we decided Hingham needs a climate action plan. Like many other um, uh, towns in Massachusetts, as many as 20 already have climate action plans. Concord and Belmont, are, their plans are of particular interest to us because they have municipal light plants as Hingham does. And uh, so we have been working on that. Um, the ask was, Board of Selectmen, please present 2020 annual town meeting with a proposal to create a Hingham Climate Action Plan. That did not happen um, because, um, because sometimes it's hard to get things going. But um, town meeting for 2021 will be taking up this proposal. And I think Brad is going to speak more about it. So I'm not going to say anything more about that right now. Uh, what happened in the year that we were working on this is that uh, we grew tremendously. People began to appear from nowhere with skills and expertise, passion and enthusiasm and a desire to do something. And so we have uh, many more people working with us now and new members brought new energy, but also new goals. So now we have three working groups within Hingham Net Zero. The community engagement group does a number of things. Uh, for this, during the time of COVID, they've been presenting online forums for Hingham people or anybody who wants to join. How do you 
a deal with deal address your carbon emissions in your home and your life. So these are the four presentations we've done so far. We're going to just keep doing them and we will repeat them as much as necessary. Um, our goal is after the climate action plan will be to enlist the people of Hingham to carry that plan out. And part, part of it is going to be learning how to change our laws. Um, they also do, the community engagement group does climate coaching. If you want to know from somebody, if you're in Hingham and you want to know, how do I get to put um, solar panels on my antique house, like this one here, um, we will uh, connect you with one of our members who's done it on their antique house and tell you how it's done, or heat pumps or whatever it is you'd like to do. And finally, we just uh, a couple of months ago, we started our visibility where you have you may have seen us driving through town. Every two weeks, we're gonna be out um, asking for the Hingham Climate Action Plan until town meeting. And it's been amazing the response that we've been getting from people driving by. I get the feeling that people are behind it. So our second group is a social media group. They run our, uh, they run our uh, uh, Facebook page and pretty soon we're gonna be on Instagram. And we are just about to uh, take on a, a college intern who's going to help us older folks, there are only a few young people in Hingham Net Zero, um, create a communications plan, a digital communications plan to get all this stuff out to the community. And finally, we have the Light Plan Action Group. Um, uh, it's obvious that if, you, if you're going to have a climate action plan and you have a municipal light plan, they're going to play a tremendous role in getting us from here to there. So we've gotten active uh, with the light board. We attend meetings and we have offered some concrete proposals, a number of which have been taken up by the, by the light plant. And when there are things that we think that they should hear from the community about, we ask people to send emails and letters. And that is kind of a new experience for the light board. They didn't used to get emails and letters. And finally, uh, we are running a candidate for the light board this spring. So that's what the light plant action group has been doing. And the way we work, we meet once a month um, we have an active membership of about 20 and an email list of 135. Isn't it always the way 20 people do all the work, but we would love to have more help. And the action groups themselves just meet as needed, usually, you know, every, every once in a while, whenever they need to meet to get their work done. And what we have learned is what a tremendous base of support there is for climate action in Hingham. We're very excited about that. When we do our work, we take ideas that come from the group and everybody pursues what they feel inspired to do. You're going to work best on something that really inspires you. But also on the other side, it's easy to get too much on your plate. And we try to always say, it's very easy to say, someone should do this and we ought to do that. And it always comes down to, okay, well, who is actually going to do that? So we try to keep our plans uh, concomitant with our resources. And then we try to make our action choices based on um, whether carbon reduction results would be positive, would be better than maybe some other action plan. So we are very excited about climate action on the ground in Hingham, and we're hopeful uh, you can visit our website, hinghamnetzero.org. If you'd like to get involved, you can go there and send us an email through there, or just send us an email directly, hinghamnetzero at gmail.com, and we'll put you on the list and let you know about all the meetings and everything we're doing, and you can connect with us on Facebook. And thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you to the League of Women Voters. Great, thank you, Laura. Uh, so this is Brad Moyer, Chair of the Energy Action Committee. Uh, I'd like to thank the other panelists for sharing their insights this evening, the League of Women Voters for hosting this session and Kathy for moderating it. And also a thank you to Laura Burns, who's one of our Uber volunteers in Hingham and, and elsewhere, just hearing the connections from the other panelists. And she's been a great partner to work with in Hingham. I don't think we could do much without her. So, so definitely thank you, Laura. Um, so I wanted to give you a little bit of a brief background on the Energy Action Committee, how we got where we are and what we're looking to do now. And a lot of that will dovetail with what Laura told you. Uh, the, the start of the committee was actually uh, much sm smaller, I think, in, in regards to uh, some other towns where there was a precursor to us, the Energy Policy Committee formed in 2006, which undertook uh, an inventory of all municipal energy usage and then wanted to set about on how to go about and reduce that. Uh, and the Energy Action Committee was formed uh, to go ahead and undertake that effort. Uh, it's an all volunteer group. There are seven of us. The general manager of the light plan is one of our members. 
Uh, and uh, it's nice to have a separate town existence, but as these things go, uh, the only authority we have is moral authority, uh, and we've, we've got no budget and we're a bunch of volunteers. Uh, so when the committee first started its efforts, unfortunately, uh, it did not make a lot of headway on uh, reducing the energy that the policy uh, committee had set forth. Uh, we were able to kind of like pluck the low hanging fruit, so to speak, uh, undertake those projects that would have an ROI of less than a year or maybe a little bit more, but it was difficult to, to make headway on those expenditures that were in the high five figures or the six figures. Uh, so after doing what we could, we decided we needed to do something more uh, to bind the town to a commitment for energy reduction. So we set about to join the green communities. Uh, we undertook that effort in 2006. We figured we could get some grant money uh, so we could apply dollars to what we needed to do. Uh, and also by, uh, through that program, the town is contracted with the department uh, or the DOER uh, of, of Massachusetts and therefore we'll be committed to 20% energy reduction targets. So we were feeling pretty good when we got that over the line of 2018, uh, but Laura and I had a nice conversation where Laura reminded me that that's not enough. Uh, we need to do more uh, and we need to think bigger than just energy uh, uh, use through the municipality, we need to target Hingham as a whole. Uh, and so uh, we started to go down the route of talking about a climate action plan. And so you're now in the 2018 timeframe, and it dovetailed nicely with other efforts going on in Hingham, uh, in addition to the Hingham Net Zero group uh, getting started shortly thereafter. Uh, the town was undertaking a municipal uh, vulnerability plan study um, uh, and had gotten a grant for that. And the Master Planning Commission uh, kicked off its work again in Hingham and started targeting sustainability measures uh, for the town. So there was a nice groundswell of movement uh, that we were all now starting to row in the same direction and climate awareness was uh, becoming quite prominent in Hingham, I'm happy to say. So we undertook a climate action plan initiative. Originally, the Energy Action Committee had tried to spear that, but as Laura indicated, it ran aground a little bit in politics uh, because the work that the committee did, the select board thought may not have been, may have been premature because we didn't have a specific monetary ask for how we were gonna go about establishing that plan. Uh, so we worked with the select board that we needed a town administration buy-in in order to figure out what dollars were necessary. So the town formed a, a separate task force of which I and other volunteers are on. Uh, the goal of which was to get to town meeting in 2021 with a goal for developing a climate action plan uh, and a specific monetary ask on what that would take to accomplish. Uh, so the committee completed its work, or at least stage one of its work uh, last month uh, and approached the select board, which they bought into. And I'm happy to say we're now moving that forward to town, town meeting in 2021. And the, the articles that we're putting forward essentially ask for um, a goal of net zero by 2040 or another date deemed feasible. Uh, we didn't want to uh, constrain our building of the plan unnecessarily. If we find that we can get earlier than 2040, absolutely. We're not gonna be constrained to 2040. If we find out that we can make a lot of headway, but we won't get quite to net neutrality until after 2040 for whatever reason, well, again, we don't wanna be constrained, but we're, we're certainly gonna to push towards that date as much as possible. Um, and then uh, the monetary amount we're still working out, but we're pleased to say that the Hingham Light Plant is on board as well and is willing to contribute to the effort. Uh, we're excited uh, and hopeful that we can get the measure passed at, at town meeting. And then we'll form a, a broader committee than just the Energy Action Committee whose remit is municipal only. We need to bring in uh, other committees within the town other interested persons, citizen volunteers to oversee the development of this plan. Uh, the hope would be that that plan would be completed um, in a year's time. Um, we'd always say we'd like to do less. Uh, we're aware that many towns who have undertaken it, it's taken longer. Uh, so, so what we will see what we can accomplish, uh, but uh, we're certainly excited to move this forward uh, and see what we can do. All right, great. Thank you, Laura and Brad. And we'll now hear Thank from you. our elected officials. First, Joan Machino, our state representative. Go ahead, Joan, the floor is yours. 
Oh, thank you so much. Uh, so let me just, first of all, thank the, the league for um, hosting this event. Uh, I think that uh, you have a great role and ability to convene across our region. And uh, it's lovely to see you bring everyone together um, tonight. Um, and then, you know, I'd just like to thank all of the panelists. Um, really, <laughs> you just dropped a lot of information and it's just, it's really exciting to see all of the work that's happening on the local level. So I want to um, thank each of you, uh, both for your commitment um, to your communities and for actually stepping forward and taking action. Um, as I was sort of taking notes on what you were saying, I was just thinking, wow, this is great. Um, I remember um, stepping forward as a selectman in 2004 for the first time, and Judith Van Ham happened to hold um, an event over at the um, Hell Life Saving Museum, and it was on climate change and sea level rise. And uh, it was sort of the beginning of the dialogue in my own mind um, in terms of and talk about planting a seed and, you know, and, and educating and elected officials on the local level and how things grow from there. Um, but it was the first time um, that I had ever participated with selectmen from each of the three towns together to hear this very theme. And when I think back on that day in 2004 and how much work has been done and how much um, you all have accomplished. Um, I just have to say kudos. It's, it's really tremendous to see how this initiative has grown. On the state level, um, the big news right now, um, and really it plays into the themes of everything that you um, have been talking about, um, and your themes around both climate awareness, um, but then um, taking action through the municipalities, um, both for sustainability and resilience, but also for the climate mitigation piece, um, which is equally important. I'm often um, say, have said that, you know, the Senator and I have advocated for millions of dollars in seawall money, um, and we do have an obligation to also work on the mitigation piece. That was what led me to file a bill that was called the 2050 Roadmap, um, and um, which became the vehicle for a larger um, bill, a really terrific bill um, that is now referred to as um, the Next Generation Roadmap. Um, and I have to say, um, it really is sort of the overarching planning piece at the state level um, that really makes our Global Warming Solutions Act. It's the key updates, the critical updates that makes our Global Warming Solutions Act um, really work. And with that bill came forward, um, not just resetting the net zero, which you're all aligning yourselves with, but also a lot of the initiatives um, that you're talking about with the, a clean energy standard for municipal light plants, environmental justice, um, wind, solar, um, and, and any other number of things um, that the Senator can also talk, uh, can speak to as one of the conferees on that climate report. Um, and so what I would just say is that the state planning um, becomes very important um, to mirror the activity that's going on at the local level, um, because what we're really doing is putting in place um, the key policy levers that will lead to the programs like the Green Communities Act and the MVP program, the 2017 Environmental Bond Bill, which is money that gets invested right into the infrastructure um, at the municipal level that really unpacks all of the work that you're doing. So I'm just going to stop there and say thank you again for everything you're doing. Uh, we will be voting this bill tomorrow. It propels the work that the state is doing um, that will come down to you through uh, the green, um, sort of the green budget and um, EEA and all of the commensurate um, um, organizations. And, um, you know, just delighted to be here and to be partners with you and to hear everything and to support all of your fantastic work. And I'll just turn it over to Senator O'Connor. Great. Thank you, Jen. Senator O'Connor. I'm trying to start the video, but I don't think it's working. Nina, can you start his video? Um, as far as I can see, he can do it. Uh, I can't. There, there he is. There no. you go. <laughs> um, so first off, thank you to uh, everyone who helped put this event together. Uh, Kathy for moderating the League of Women Voters in Hingham uh, for hosting this. To Corey, Steve, Judith, Jake, Laura, and Brad. Um, I truly appreciate all the efforts that you are putting forth on so many different levels here on the South Shore. I always believe that the South Shore is um, really at the forefront of 
uh, making sure that we play our part that we need to play in reducing emissions and making sure we have a sustainable planet. One of the uh, centerpieces of my legislative agenda since taking office about five years ago has always been environmental policy. As Representative Moschino said, I think you picked a great night for uh, this presentation because we are on the eve of both the House and the Senate passing once again, uh, one of the most comprehensive emission reduction bills in the history of our country. And it will set us on a path to net zero emissions by 2050 with five, five year incremental uh, accountability benchmarks from now until then. And in addition, there's a lot of good outside sections. Uh, as Jonas said, I was proud to spend four months between December and, excuse me, between the end of July and December, putting the final version of this bill together as one of the six conferees in the House and the Senate. But this also has a component to make investments into green, uh, green economy, uh, job creation. It defines and codifies environmental justice, which I think is a huge win uh, for so many low-income communities across the state. Um, it creates a municipal opt-in uh, for a stretch energy code. It funds research and development for green technology, such as making heat pumps uh, more cost efficient increases the renewable portfolio standard 3% each year from 2025 to 2029. And uh, one of the amendments that I was actually able to get in there, which would create a grant program for low income support service organizations, such as food pantries or domestic violence shelters, that they can go out and get money from the state to fund solar initiatives and the money that they save on utilities can then be redirected back into services. In addition to that, uh, very locally, but using the power and privilege of this office to try and institute change at the state level has been working on being a steadfast opponent of the Weymouth compressor station. This has been something that predates my time at, in the Senate as I was a city council president before this in Weymouth. And this has been something we've been fighting for the better part of seven and a half years. And my hope is that we can continue and Representative Moschino has been such a tremendous advocate as had so many people I was looking through the participants in the panel is so many people here to really just express to the, to the local state and federal levels that there needs to be more oversight and there has to be a reconsideration of the siting of that compressor station. There's been ups and downs with that, but I truly believe that the potential for FERC now to rehear, uh, while it's why it's widely inappropriate to um, place that compressor at the forward basin is the most hope we've had in, in quite some time. Legislatively, I sit on the Global, <clears throat> Global Warming and Climate Change Committee. Um, we've put in legislation and worked on legislation in my office for rapid solar mobility, as Judith had talked about, incentivizing recycling of lottery tickets, banning single-use plastics, putting deposits on NIPs, and promoting and nurturing green energy and technology in the field that I really have landed on the most is anaerobic digestion, as I just have found it fascinating and have seen the state really falter in its ability to nurture and grow that specific technology here in the Commonwealth. Uh, to end, you know, we talk about a lot of issues day in and day out, but I don't think there's a singular more important issue that we're facing than leaving a sustainable planet for our future generations. I was able to speak on the floor uh, as one of the conferees during the 2050 roadmap bill, which I also gave Representative Moschino a tremendous amount of credit for spearheading and being able to work with partners and across the aisle in order to really push that forward. Um, but when I spoke, I said, it's time to get real. You know, it's time to get real about the role that we all have to play in uh, making sure that we do have a sustainable future. Um, you know, far too often we, uh, we come out and, and, and we have to, you know, get into arguments with people on, on some of the basic fundamentals of um, making sure that we have a sustainable planet. So one of the things I see Kathy coming back on, so I'll, I'll leave it, but um, just thank you for all the work that you've done. Uh, we'll continue to, uh, to advance and hopefully Massachusetts will be that standard bearing leader as we are in so many other categories when it comes to uh, clean energy and a sustainable future. Great, thank you. Thank you, Patrick. If all the panelists can come um, back on video, we do have a few questions um, that I know we'd like to hear all your opinions on. There are two questions related to sea rise. And I think I'll present them both and then maybe each town can speak to what their town is doing for sea rise. The first one is just generally, does each, each town have a plan? 
And then the second question is more specific. Um, Hingham needs to rebuild and raise its seawalls. Do other towns face this issue? And if so, do they work with other towns and the Commonwealth to get guidance? Or does each town have to reinvent the wheel themselves? Okay, I'll take that. Um, Hingham, Hingham does have a climate uh, mitigation plan um, that was completed maybe about three years ago. And uh, what it did was it, it showed uh, the areas in town, much like the map that Steve showed for Cohasset, showed the areas in town that are vulnerable to flooding. And um, yes, other towns have to fix their seawalls, especially Hull, but I'm sure Cohasset <laughs> does too. So I think that we might ask um, Representative Mosquito to speak to that because one of her one of her primary goals has been to get the South Shore towns working together, especially on issues like that. Um, thanks, Laura. And also um, in my life as a former selectman, I can tell you that Hull absolutely has a plan. Um, and in fact, each of your towns um, participated in the municipal vulnerability planning process. Um, and I participated in both Hull's and in, in Cohasset's um, it was a terrific process that really brought together every single community voice you could possibly think of um, for all stakeholders to identify both what the where the vulnerabilities were, but also where our assets were. And the, the idea was that um, through doing that planning process, it would enable the communities not only to identify the, the opportunities and the places where they wanted to work both to um, for resilience, but also for opportunities um, uh, to strengthen um, it also would lead to future grants um, for these kinds of investments to come into your community and to really tailor it based on what you need. So you all have those plannings. Um, and I, I can speak to the fact that Hull has been doing that kind of planning for quite a long time. It's everything from a, you know, a seawall inventory um, to how we're going to you know, use our natural planning to GPSing or all our GIS, excuse me, of all of our you know drainage. I mean, it, some of it's very granular and very infrastructure based, um, but um, but our public safety works closely with our um, municipal um, DPWs and um, and and it works across all levels. And if I could just um, build on that, I mean, that's actually was the top of my mind as well. The municipal vulnerability program, and this is uh, you know GIS or or you know. Uh, electronically mapped, you know, uh, elevations, which will tell our towns where the water comes from, where our vulnerable points, where are places that are ideal to shore up either permanently, or if we're expecting a big storm where emergency management can come in and put in temporary barriers. That way we know where, th where the soft spots are. And that's, um, de that determines how the entire planning department makes their long-term project goals that it determines how uh, the fire trucks go down the road. Um, and, and that kind of planning is really, I mean, it, it's, it's ingrained now in kind of everything we do. I just put a website that everyone can use to find out for themselves how they might be affected by sea level rise. It's riskfinder.climatecontrol.org. Are there any plans for rising sea levels other than seawalls? That's what we're doing this for. <laughs> I, <you> know, I <laughs> would, so, so I would, I would add, um, when I get questions like that, I, I'll try to be brief because I know there's lots of people on here. Uh, I interface with quite literally the world's largest manufacturers for a living. And what I find is that they want to do good, but they don't know how. And what, what we find as we bridge the connection between people who want to do good and people who can help us do good within these massive organizations, there's misunderstanding. And usually the misunderstanding is that climate change is going to destroy our planet. That is not true. Our planet, unless it gets hit by a very large chunk of stuff in space, will be here. But all of humanity and millions and millions of species and our ability to have biodiversity will cease to exist. What we're fighting is ourselves. 
And what we're talking about is essentially stopping the, the poison that we're, we're causing to ourselves and our ability and this planet's ability to sustain our lives and millions of other species that we all like and want to have around. And climate change is very real. Sea level rise is one symptom of the actual disease, essentially. And treating the symptom with seawalls buys us time. And there are lots of other things that we're doing to buy time. But what we actually need is a systemic change and we need to electrify everything that we can and then produce as much electricity as we can without generating CO2 emissions to produce that energy. And last, we need to transition from a carbon-based economy to a hydrogen-based economy where we can't use um, electricity. I'm a private pilot. I'm very passionate about flying and you will take my ability to fly a plane away uh, when I'm dead. <laughs> it's a very fun thing for me. However, there is a future where aviation can still happen without carbon emissions. And that's what I don't think people have understood yet, right? The, the idea of, oh, I can't have my lights on or I can't enjoy being warm or I can't, that's all a bunch of BS. We can get all of these things. We can have all the luxuries we want in our life and still do it without generating CO2 emissions. And that's what I think the overarching theme here is that we need to prepare for a future where we're not generating CO2 emissions while still living out our lives and, and enjoying, you know, the, the modern technologies that we all have come to enjoy. Uh, I know that's a bit philosophical, but I hope that, that that answers the question of the sorts of things that we're working on long-term are transitioning our, our piece of the world towards that future where we're actually treating the disease and not the symptom. There just is a another... Oops, sorry. Please, no, no, please go ahead. Bob. No, no, I was just going to say, uh, from a practical land uh, standpoint, you know, when you talk about um, seawalls, is that all we're doing? Um, water doesn't only come in from the sea. <clears throat> uh, there are also uh, worsening storms, you know, that will happen inland and work their way out. So you need to be concerned with water coming in from that mechanism. So you need uh, drainage issues. Uh, you need roadway uh, improvements for drainage and also for uh, evacuation if necessary. Um, you need to worry about sewer pump stations and other things. So there's, it's not just building defenses around the edges. There's a whole interior infrastructure component that also has to be taken into consideration you're talking about how vulnerable is your community to climate change. Um, really if, if I could add to that, one of the other pieces of infrastructure that we very rarely talk about, um, but that is actually critically important is natural, natural lands and natural nature-based solutions. Um, and so even though we don't always talk about it quite this way, one of the things that our communities actually do very well is preserve open space. Um, and we also use, um, our, 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 um, our natural grasslands. And I think of the dunes and hull, I think of, I think of all of the conservation lands and the, the Way River Estuary. Um, and those, those function both as resilience measures for, um, for storm surges and the floods that Brad was talking about, um, but it also is about carbon sinks. And that was actually a key piece that the Nature Conservancy got into the climate change bill that we're about to pass tomorrow. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's a green infrastructure um, piece that we really should be very mindful of. And that comes up a lot when we do smart, smart growth planning um, and, and really incorporate all of those aspects into every piece of our, um, every piece of our, um, our planning efforts. And in fact, all of our towns have open space um, plans and as part of their master planning. And in fact, all of our towns um, take that into consideration when we're doing roadways and other kinds of um, event planning and impervious services and things like that. And I apologize, Laura, I interrupted you, please. No, you didn't, I interrupted you. Um, the, uh, I was just gonna say that there are two pieces to this, right? There's the climate resilience piece. And yes, there is more to be done about that than just seawalls. For example, you know, when we get the 100 year storm, which is now a 10 year storm, uh, the water is going to come right up the Weir River, and there's a bridge on Rockland Street that's going to be underwater. So we got to do something about that bridge. You have to do something to protect the roadways, like Corey said, make sure the, the emergency services can get everywhere they need to get. 
so there's that, taking care of ourselves and our community. And then there's what are we gonna to do to take care of everyone else? Because in fact, if we don't do our share to take care of the world, if everybody doesn't do our share, we're all going down together. And actually, I think, you know, to that point, we're at the front lines of this. I mean, you know, to, to what Jake said earlier, this is a global problem and we are on the front lines. We need to be the leaders on this. You know, we are the communities that are also blessed with the ability. We have the right demographics to attack this head on. We have a, a state legislature that is very supportive of these programs. Um, so the South Shore could be, uh, you know, a, a nationwide or global leader on this issue. And this is something that, uh, to your point, Laura, no one's going to do this without someone leading. You know, we have to set an example that other people can follow because we can't do this alone. Um, and But we can't wait for somebody else to do something about it. That's great. So, um, would the panelists like to elaborate on environmental justice? Oh, Senator, I think, I think this one's for you and the Weymouth Compressor Station. Sure. Uh, so in the next generation bill that we'll be voting on tomorrow, and we voted on this prior to the end of session, but the governor disagreed with certain components of the bill and sent the bill back to us. So we're basically sending him back the same bill again so he can procedurally uh, either amend and veto where he didn't have that opportunity in the time we got it to him. But one of the major components is the definition of environmental justice. It's far from perfect um, because it still does incorporate sort of some communities that probably shouldn't be classified as an environmental justice community that do have um, hit certain triggers, whether it be a demographics of uh, minority populations or, or similar to that, none of, the low, none of the low income components specifically towards that. Mike Barrett has actually the lead sponsor of the bill, uh, the chair of the Telecommunications Utility and Energy Committee has actually highlighted this as a concern, something that we can work on in the future, but Massachusetts has never had um, a real definition and codification of what an environmental justice neighborhood is. And so when you look at the, the compressor station, for example, you see uh, directly uh, next to that is the Germantown neighborhood of Quincy, which is um, home to many low income uh, families as well as low income housing projects. And the ability for corporations in general to go and uh, site infrastructure near these areas, knowing that these people uh, typically don't have the means to go up against these billion dollar energy corporations to fight back uh, has been sort of a business model uh, for way too long. And this will once and for all in Massachusetts really put some teeth into our environmental justice language to say that these are certain requirements that we need to look at now specifically. And it's not just the environmental component, but it's who actually lives there and how much have they been exposed and for how long to way too much industrial pollution because they've been taken advantage of. And so I'm proud of the work that we've been able to do in that. Joan and I have been asking for this since we've both gotten in the legislature and this finally does it. As I said, it's not perfect, but it's, it's going to be a very, very good uh, first step in making sure that we protect low income individuals from a overexposure to um, energy corporations infrastructure. Yeah. And, and I just add that, um, you know, it, it's the kind of, um, it's the kind of thing that we've now that we've codified, we don't have to rely any longer on sort of the goodwill of who is in the governor's office or not. Um, we have been relying on um, an executive order up till um, this far. And it, you know, as, as the senator was saying, it has not led to the kinds of um, signals to um, DEP and DPU um, that has really led to any kind of pr pr protection. So it's really going to be transformative in terms of, of the siting and the ability of, um, of our communities to advocate. Um, following up on that bill, um, I'm working with Rep. Adrian Madero, um, who was one of the primary authors of the EJ bill um, out of East Boston. And we're gonna be filing a, an access to justice bill this session, um, which, is really just to say, um, to create standing for Massachusetts residents to bring these kinds of disparate impact claims in state court. Um, so we're excited, uh, as the Senator was saying, it's not quite perfect, but that's all right. Um, it's a great start and it signals 
by the legislature, the commitment um, to the health and the welfare and the protection of um, the people in the state. Um, and uh, there's a lot more work to be done and we're gonna do it together. I'd like to quickly jump in there. Thank uh, the Senator and the representative for what you're doing and remind you both, perfection is the enemy of progress. So thank you and good work. Thank you. Um, Steve and Corey, it looks like Cohasset has accomplished many great projects with the help of grants. Could you provide some perspective on how to know what grants are out there and how a town can apply? Uh, well, maybe Corey could answer this too, but um, most of our grants have come through the Green Communities Act. Uh, until recently, it was difficult for muni communities like um, Hingham and Hull to uh, to, to become a green community, but I think the rules have been changed somewhat. So now that is possible, um, but it, it's really a great program and you just have to sign up, uh, commit to meet certain objectives. Uh, like uh, we had to promise to um, uh, purchase only electric cars for, for the uh, municip municipality. Uh, we had to agree that we put in energy efficiency um, uh, improvements to uh, reduce our carbon footprint. Um, and uh, some other things, um, but basically it wasn't it wasn't difficult, and uh, I I would think every community would want to do this. It's, it's tremendous, uh, you know, help to communities to get the state aid. Also, we we found other uh, sources of of uh, revenue uh, income. Um, we saw that uh, National Grid had a program for uh, putting in um, uh, charging stations. Uh, so there are other, other sources there too. Uh, you want to comment, Corey? Yeah, I think, uh, Steve, you, you kind of covered it. But one thing, I mean, grant writing is as much of an art as a science. Uh, but however, one big thing that, that the Alternative Energy Committee really prioritized was having stuff that was shovel ready. Um, so identifying what we could do before or, you know, it, it, parallel with when we found a grant. So when we applied for a grant, we were ready to go with, um, you know, for the, the charging stations where they were going to go, so we could apply for um, Volkswagen settlement money or, or national grid money. Uh, when it comes to having solar arrays, we already they've already mapped where they're going to go, and that involved actually going to the town and town meeting and authorizing funding for studies for these things. So, uh, you know, having the towns own, take ownership and and I think you know Brad alluded to it earlier, doing things unfunded is difficult, but if you can put some funding behind you know, really putting a plan together. It makes it a lot easier to apply for grants because you've already done the work to say, we can deploy this now. We can make a difference now. And Jake alluded to it earlier. There's a lot of money out there that is looking for some place to go. So if you bring a plan, you're going to find a grant that can, that can support it. When you said that um, Cohasset had to agree to buy electric municipal cars, did that include police cruisers? Um. I'm trying to recall. I think there was uh, a possible exception, but uh, the electric police cru cruisers have really improved. Uh, do you know, Corey? Are are we getting uh, electric uh, cruisers yet? Or as I as I understand it, that's that's part of a different uh, kind of purchasing structure. I see I see Jones kind of nodding her head. Um, so the vehicles we had were for municipal use. So when it go, uh, tax assessors or uh, any type of uh, anyone that's in uh, like if the town manager has a meeting or, right. you know, there's the different, that's what these cars are used for. They aren't uh, specialty vehicles. We're not talking about DPW, your trucks, that kind of stuff. It's really for uh, municipal employees for transportation purposes. But it'd be great if this got extended to, I mean, school buses, I think is kind of the next, um, you know, good place to focus some effort, um, you know, because it protects both our kids and it's, it's kind of the perfect use for, for, for elect electrically powered uh, vehicles. Oh. And I know that question was directed to uh, Cohasset, but if you don't mind, if, uh, if I jump in quickly too, because we underwent the same thing. And there are a lot of exemptions under the efficient fuel vehicle policy for green communities, such so that many of your town vehicles are actually exempt. So think about, as Corey mentioned, your DPW uh, vehicles, your school buses, your police cruisers. Um, so we put in our policy in 2018, and frankly, it, we haven't had it enacted yet because um, we haven't required a vehicle that um, is, as Corey was describing, your general just town administrator driving from one end of the town to the other. Um, that being said, 
I believe Easton has recently brought in an all electric police cruiser. Um, and we in Hingham have been trying to set up some time with our police department to talk about the possibilities of bringing on such a vehicle when you look at the economics for how much the average police cruiser drives and expends energy just idling. Uh, it's almost a no brainer. Uh, again, as in most things with uh, climate uh, and energy saving matters, the upfront cost is just higher. And you have to be willing to swallow that to get the ROI over a couple of years, which will really pay out in the long run. And, and that's kind of our, our constant mantra and challenge is like, swallow it now and you will be better in the long run. <laughs> you know? uh, and you just have to keep pounding the table with that argument. That, I want to just mention for Hull, um, the Clean Energy Climate Action Committee is writing our first annual report that actually says, here's what you all should do. Not just one group, but we're talking about the stretch code for, for the building code. We're talking about a number of things for specifically the elect electrification of town vehicles. We don't believe yet that it's fair to tell the town, Department of Public Works, your plow trucks better become electric. I don't have an extra million dollars laying around in Hull. I mean, that it's not feasible yet, but what we do believe is feasible is municipal vehicles um, that you guys are talking about and police cruisers. And our recommendation is going to be to the town when your vehicles, not now, but when your vehicles reach the end of their useful life, which how do you define that up for debate? But I think that's something that we can manage. You will only replace these types of vehicles with battery electric vehicles. It can be any battery electric vehicle they want, but we're telling them when they reach the end of the useful life, that way they can start planning for it now and we can even start budgeting for it now. And, and what Brad said, I don't even have to do the economics. I own an electric car myself. You have a higher first cost, no question about it. You have a much lower ongoing cost and you get an ROI on that higher first cost. Great. So, is the U.S. rejoining the Paris Accord having an impact on your work or your approach? I'm just going to say that that feeling that I've had um, of people coming out of the woodwork and hang them to work on this issue, um, what's happened at the national level, what's happening at the state level, it just feels like the ship is turning around and it's easier it's easier to work if you have hope, if you have uh, compatriots, and um, it has changed, I think, everybody's perspective. I would just say that actually not being in the Paris Agreement, and trust me, I'm not arguing that <laughs> that should not have been the case, but it, it was a powerful motivator at the local level. It's easy to look at this issue and say it is so daunting that it cannot succeed without national leadership, international cooperation, and so forth. And when you look and you say, my God, that's just not happening, you know, and you have to make the decision at that moment is, all right, well, are we dead in the water? Or is there something that we can do about it? Uh, so I found that the fact that, you know, we had pulled out originally uh, to help motivate greater action at the local level because we realized if we can't rely on national leadership, then it's gonna to have to happen at the local level. And the reality is it always has to happen at the local level, but it's just a good reminder that we really need to take action now. So I'd like to say something about the Paris Climate Accords. Um, I, for better or worse, deal with a lot of companies that have very much so a global presence and there's actually been a sigh of relief within those large companies that I've been hearing about. And what happened uh, once we knew who won the election back in November, because that's a, when I believe we knew that, uh, what happened since then has been here, it's coming. And a lot of the companies I, I help work with um, at a corporate level are expecting a price on carbon uh, and are not against it for the most part. Some of them are, but most of them are not uh, because they believe that if we have an international price on carbon, that it's a fair playing field and it will actually help them achieve some of their loftier goals sooner because it will force their competitors who maybe don't quite agree with them on certain environmental policies to be doing what is a minimum. And, and so uh, general consensus is helpful. And what I'll add 
sort of going off of what Brad said is that um, the way to move a group of people is to identify who the stakeholders are, engage them in the process, help them understand the benefits if they actually take action. And uh, what the us re, the U.S. rejoining the Accords do largely engages millions, if not billions, of stakeholders, re, or re-engages them within the process. So I, I think that uh, it helps advance things in less time. It's it's all around good. Thanks. We, you've all listened to each other's presentations tonight. We were wondering if the panelists have any questions for each other. I would just love to say how how impressed and how excited I am whenever I see the uh, the Hingham uh, the, you know carbon zero uh, stuff out there. That's just it's so exciting. Uh, I, I honk obnoxiously. I hope that's good and not bad. Um, but you know, it's just it's such a. I just it's. I mean, seeing this local. I mean, to what everyone said is here. It's like we got to do this ourselves. And, and seeing this kind of energy, it's infectious. Um, so thank you for for getting that together and kind of spreading that infection to us. I also feel like like. Our rep and our senator are, are two of the key people in the legislature. You know, uh, it's wonderful. Thank you. I just got a question for uh, uh, Representative Machino and uh, uh, Senator O'Connor. Um, just a nuts and bolts question. What's the strategy and schedule for reintroducing the roadmap bill uh, and getting it passed quickly and signed by the, or not, have the veto over, uh, over ridden by the, uh, of the governor. Well, so the, we'll the bill's already tomorrow. tomorrow. It's already been re, it's already been filed. Um, it was filed jointly by Senator uh, Barrett and Representative Golden, who are the chairs of Telecom Utility Energy and the key architects of the of the um, conference committee report. Uh, the consensus. Okay, when can we expect to get a vote on it? Tomorrow. tomorrow. A vote. We'll have a vote tomorrow. I just introduced. We'll have a vote. And will amendments be entertained? No. No. Well, I don't know that they will or won't be entertained, but the plan is to, um, it's, we're treating this like a true conference committee report, even though it is a new bill essentially filed in a new session. Um, there, it is, it's the exact bill from okay. last session. So, so we don't have to worry about amendments fouling up the works. Okay. Nope. Good. It's just, it's going to be an up or down vote uh, and send it back to the governor. Wonderful. Thank you. So we have a question about wind turbines, the offshore wind turbines, turbines. Uh, you, Jake. I, okay. So if you go to hull2030.com, um, and I'm just going to check to make sure that I'm not a liar here. I believe I'm correct. Hull2030.com. And I don't know why my browser hasn't saved that because I go there frequently. The, uh, the first image there you'll see is an aerial image of Hull that was taken by Ben Maitland Lewis, who's on the Clean Energy Climate Action Committee uh, from a plane that I was flying over Hull uh, in the winter time. And if you hit learn more, uh, I believe, oh, maybe it's not that, tips and resources. There's another page on there um, with an aerial photo of um, the wind turbines that are off the shore of um, Block, Block Island, Island, Rhode Island, and Judith and Connie Gorfinkel and, and Ben and I have all flown out there um, to, and, and actually on one of the trips we landed, and just fly there, we landed and we went into town and talked with some of the people who were intimately involved in that project and getting the five turbines offshore there. And I know that's Rhode Island and we're Massachusetts, so you know, why are you talking about Rhode Island? Well, we looked at them as an example of Oh my gosh, somewhere we can fly to. It was not even a 30 minute flight. We can fly there. It's right there. They've already done it. They know how to do it. And where they did it is harder than where we want to do it. Um, it's one of the initiatives in the platform I ran on was energy independence for Hull. Uh, I'm on the, the uh, light board and I am working on trying to develop a decision-making framework for the light plant. And one of the major projects would be putting a bunch of offshore wind turbines, uh, maybe not a bunch, but enough to generate far more power than Hull could ever consume 
and sync the cost of that project in with additional supply lines. So uh, there are people right in Hull who are working very hard on that. And there are ways to make it happen, but it is a very large undertaking. We're talking about a project that may approach $500 million. So these aren't small things, they're, they're big things, but because we have a small number of people who are passionate about it and won't give up, I think that something will eventually happen. According to what I've looked at, one or two of the really large wind turbines that are now available, uh, they've been available for about two years, could provide all of Hull's existing electricity, plus have air source heat pumps in all of the houses. Um, so our light board would double its business. Um, and what Jake's talking about is having a little bit more so we can sell some of that electricity and, and make money for making all of this work well for all of us. That's correct, Judith. One, there is one particular design that's already approved, not necessarily in Massachusetts, but has been uh, permitted elsewhere from General Electric that can produce more power than Hull could consume, even if everybody in Hull had heat pumps, uh, because we already have two wind turbines here. With a second one, we could start looking at a scheme to export power. Uh, and if we had a third one, or if we had a bit of a longer tail, but the um, the tidal energy generator at Hull Gut, which we're going to pilot probably this summer, uh, that would be generating 13 megawatts right there um, all the time, except for a slack tide, which slack tide isn't too long. So there are there are ways to utilize the resources and the unique geography of Hull to generate power without any carbon emissions. So the, these are things that uh, we're working on and we're passionate about it. And if you want to get involved, go to hull2030.com uh, on one of the, I think get involved. Yep, you click on get involved, scroll down, put in your email and you will get updates from us. Great. I want to thank everybody who joined for your interest in climate change and in finding ways that we can all work together for the greater good. Special thanks to our panelists for sharing their time and their expertise with us. This has been a presentation by the League of Women Voters of Hingham. The recording of this webinar will be available on the Hingham League of Women Voters website, www.lwvhingham.org and shown on Harbor Media TV. Thank you again, everyone.